All right. Uh, great to meet with our church family. Uh, we are presenting our online uh, version of Sunday's sermon in this format. Uh, today, we're breaking in some new uh, sound, video, and streaming people. And this, uh, we thought, was a good way to uh, alleviate some of the stress for them. So grab your scripture uh, and locate Mark chapter 16. And uh, our study this evening today is, And the Rest is History. No matter uh, how much you've attended, not attended church, this song, these words will probably uh, catch on with you real quick. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. This brings us to a uh, key truth for today, key truth uh, in our passage uh, in Mark 16. God's grace is amazing and it's available today. God's grace is uh, amazing, it's available, it's available for you today. We're in the final moments of the Gospel of Mark and our eyes lock in again on chapter 16 verse 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so they might come and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, even though it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe. They were amazed. The angel said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Then they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What have we learned already in these eight verses? The That... For followers of Jesus were to be devoted to anything connected to Jesus. And second of all, we learned last week that the day of resurrection is a special day. It's a Jesus celebration for his church. Among all the other things we can be doing and, and, and do do, uh, the celebration of Jesus with his church is a priority. Then we, we entered into the empty tomb last week and made some discoveries. And, and here's where we want to jump in again the, this morning as uh, we look into this passage. Three, to, three discoveries jump out at us. Number one, the tomb is empty. Number two, Jesus is alive. And here we go. Number three, the Gospel of Mark finishes right here in verse 8 with this word, afraid. They were afraid. Now, a couple words of caution I want to give you as we uh, begin our study this morning. Caution number one, do not hear what I do not say. And caution number two, do hear what I do say. And kind of the, the, it, the pressure's on you to not read into something that I don't say and uh, to clearly hear uh, what I'm uh, trying to stress and encourage for you this morning. The ending of this gospel is abrupt. And that ending is intentional. Here's the discovery, our key truth for today. God's grace is amazing and available today. 
key words we're going to see again and again and again. Amazed, astonished, alarmed. Amazed, astonished, alarmed. And those are three appropriate responses for us when we interact with, when we come face to face with Jesus Christ. God's grace is amazing and available. Let's jump in. Here's the issue. As we come to uh, chapter 16, most of our scriptures, our English, <coughs> excuse me, translations, will give us a verse 9 through 20, and some even give a little, uh, an, an additional ending to that. You'll notice this section is in brackets. It's in brackets because it's what we call a variant. There is question whether it belongs in the text or not. And throughout your scripture, there are a number of variants. We'll just be honest up front about that. There are a number of variants. Most of them are very, very minor. Uh, today, we're going to uh, address probably two passages that are a little longer and uh, see how they come into play here. And again, the caution, do not hear what I do not say. Do hear what I do say. As we look at verse 9 through 20, because it's part of, it, it's there, and we want to deal with it. We could brush it off, but let's deal with it. Uh, in, in my MacArthur Study Bible, we have this comment that I think sums up um, the assessment of most evangelical scholars. The external evidence strongly suggests that these verses, 6 through 20, were not originally part of Mark's gospel. Later on in his explanation, he makes this comment. But for the most part, while for the most part they summarize truths that are taught elsewhere in scripture. And if you look at verse 9 through 20, you find uh, the post-resurrection appearances of Christ referenced, the assignment of Christ to his church to go and make disciples, and third, we, we find uh, references, discussion about the ascension of Christ after the resurrection back up into heaven. And you'll find post-resurrection appearances, uh, the assignment of Christ, the ascension of Christ, all dealt with, all promoted in other passages of the New Testament. So the issue here, mostly, predominantly, is not so much whether what is said here is true, but does it legitimately belong in this ending of uh, Mark chapter 16. So there's the issue before us. Let me give you uh, a bit of an explanation as we work our way through this. Uh, as I've studied it, and I think one of the predominant uh, view of most evangelical scholars, or many evangelical scholars, is Mark ends his gospel as he started his gospel, abruptly. Chapter 1, verse 1 Mark just jumps in, and away he goes. And then he comes to the end of the gospel, and it's like, boom, we're done. So he ends his gospel, ends his gospel as he starts it abruptly, and in between the beginning and the end is an energetic, highlighted focus on the amazing, astonishing, and yes, at times alarming Jesus Christ. Let me read for you verse 1 of chapter 1. Beginning words of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's how he starts, and it's how he's going to end in chapter 16. It appears, verse 8, they went out, fled from the tomb, based on the discovery and the identity of, that Jesus Christ is God the Son. Let me suggest four posts that kind of anchor our dock this morning and, and help us as we 
seek to understand this chapter, which is what we want to do, understand the implications to our life and make some applications uh, for it as we go along. Post number one. And again, remember the, the cautions that I've given you. Post number one, the Bible, the Bible's absolute authority and inerrancy is non-negotiable. This is a statement you want to you want to burn into your into your thinking. Even write down the Bible's absolute authority and inerrancy means there's no mistakes is non-negotiable. I as a pastor, we as a church, we as a church fellowship, we affirm the Bible's absolute authority and inerrancy. What the Bible says, God is saying. And this book in front of us is God's speech in written form. Now, we ask ourselves, and it's a good question, well, how do we get from God's mind to the paper, uh, to what we think of as the Bible? There's a process and a product. 1 Timothy 3.16 talks about the process. All scripture is inspired by God. Some of your English translations will say it that way. Uh, it means it's God breathed out. And it, it's almost the exact opposite of inspiration, which we're thinking of taking something in. But the Bible is God's breathed out truth. He breathed out his heart, his thoughts into a select group of men who then breathed out through their personalities, through their individual writing styles, God's thoughts, God's truths, and God preserved those accurately how he wanted them uh, preserved. So there's the process and the product, 2 Timothy 1, verse 20 and 21, we have uh, the word of God. It's not the words of men, but uh, men wrote down what God told them as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. And uh, and I'll, I'll probably just touch on the issue this morning of the preservation of Scripture. And at first it may seem I'm, I'm saying just the opposite, but hang in there and we could have a very detailed uh, study uh, on this of uh, papyrus and parchments and manuscripts and the and actually, I thought about treating it uh, this way this morning, and we can do that. And if you have questions, uh, uh, let let me have those questions, and, and we'll gladly deal with it. Uh, but there's so much information that we can't cover it all in this this amount of time. But we certainly can, and there's certainly a a ton of evidence out there uh, that talk about the reliability. Uh, the trustworthiness of the Bible, of the Bible in your hands. And that's a theme that that we try and emphasize every week in the pulpit, in all of our teaching ministries throughout the church. The Bible is absolutely trustworthy. Uh, and what it says, it, it means, and we're, we're uh, driven to find out what it means. Every time we come to a passage, there's, there's one meaning, uh, and we need to understand what that one meeting is correctly. And then the implications of that passage and the implications drive our application of the text. So post number one that, that gives some stability to our doc, we affirm the Bible's absolute authority in inerrancy. It's non-negotiable. That's something we go to the wall over that we will die for. Number two, the oldest manuscripts of Mark do not contain the section, chapter 16, verse 9 through 20. Uh, it was about 200 years before this section starts showing up in some of the, the later manuscripts. And uh, there seems to be a difference in style, in vocabulary, in structure. That That's some of my assessment, uh, as well as others. And uh, But it was not in the oldest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark. Now that brings us to post number three. This reality is not unsettling, rather just the opposite. It is confidence boosting in the accuracy of the Bible 
the more we look at it, the more we study it, the more we see how diligent the, the copyist of scripture uh, were and, and the, the science of, of textual criticism, a, a credible science, how diligent they are. The more you study this, the greater your confidence is and, and can be and, and ought to be in the accuracy of the Bible. As we look at chapter 16, 9 through 20, and I'm going to take you to another passage in, in just a moment. <clears throat> there is no Christian doctrine at stake. Uh, no Christian doctrine is affected, altered, or compromised in any passage where there is some translation uncertainty. Some of these bracketed issues where we have to work hard and, and sometimes it's, it's not crystal clear. But there is no doctrine, Christian doctrine, that is challenged on the line uh, by this. And like I, I said uh, earlier, the appearances of Christ, the assignment of Christ, the ascension of Christ, all taught elsewhere uh, in the New Testament. So if, if 9 through 20 doesn't belong in here, we still understand that Christ appeared to people after the resur after his resurrection, that he gave his church a clear assignment to make disciples, and he has ascended back to heaven, doing what he's doing now in preparing to come back. Let me take you over. Turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, uh, real quick. And one of the other uh, passage, bracketed passages, we'll just call it the, a little uh, lengthy. We're looking at two lengthy ones. One because, you know, obviously it, it shows up in Mark and I've got to deal with it. I think I'm, re I'm responsible to deal with it. Uh, but uh, let me come back to uh, chapter 7, verse 53, and it's going to bleed into chapter 8. Like I said, no essential Christian doctrine is affected or altered in any passage where there are translation uncertainties. John 7, verse 53. Everyone went to his own, to his home. Now, it's either in the text or it isn't. We're not sure. But either way, that verse isn't going to affect your faith, is it? Well, that, then it bleeds into chapter 8, and there's a passage, verse 1 through 11 of chapter 8, but a woman caught in adultery. You may be familiar with the story. Uh, uh, those who are hostile to Christ uh, bring a woman supposedly caught in the act of adultery. They say, our law says she should be stoned. What do you think we should do with her? And the story has Jesus kneeling down and riding in the dirt, and everyone essentially disappears. There are legitimate questions whether this paragraph is part of the original uh, writings of the Gospel of John. If it's not in there, there, there is no, there is still no essential Christian doctrine affected. You look throughout the Bible, we understand God's holy, we understand he's righteous, we understand he's against adultery, we understand he is, uh, uh, we're all accountable to him, we also understand the presence of grace and mercy to those who are repentant, and that's taught everywhere else in scripture. So if this, if the John passage isn't in there, uh, our understanding of the character of Christ and what is appropriate for Christians is not altered uh, in, <coughs> in the least. So I've given you three posts so far. Absolute authority of Scripture, inerrancy, not questioned, not negotiable. Oldest manuscripts of Mark do not have this uh, passage in there. It shouldn't be unsettling, but rather confidence-boosting as we understand more and more that, uh, how uh, translation work uh, has gone through the centuries. And here's number four, uh, post number four I want to give you. A good study Bible is a priority purchase for you.
you need to have a good study Bible. In fact, I'd recommend a couple of them. I'm going to give you my impression of that I think the very best, the two best study Bibles. The one I use uh, most weeks in the pulpit uh, is the John MacArthur Study Bible, and I use the New American Standard uh, uh, version. Uh, that is an excellent one. It's available in a couple different translations, but the study notes are excellent. And then a very close uh, photo finish, I'd say tie, is... Uh, uh, was the Holman uh, Christian Standard Bible. Now it's just known as the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, and those notes are excellent as well. Coming in, uh, going for the bronze medal, you might say, is the Jeremiah Study Bible and uh, the NIV Study Bible, uh, from my perspective. Now the notes aren't inspired. Those are the author's assessment, the author's interpretation, uh, either directly or through an editorial team. But uh, I think those are excellent ones, and I'd recommend those for you and get one. And uh, um, if I can help you on that, I'd be glad to. Well, that, we've looked at the issue a bit and uh, a bit of explanation. Now let's come back uh, into this whole chapter 16 and a couple of emphasis that we want to take away uh, today. Mark ends his gospel as he starts it. He starts abruptly, he ends abruptly. In between, an energetic, highlighted, highlight focus of the amazing, astonishing, alarming at times Jesus Christ. Number one, this abrupt ending fits with Mark's aggressive pace on every page of the book. This gospel moves. And uh, in your notes, um, and if you need a copy of the highlighted notes and you, you can't make it on Sunday, you, you give us, contact us. We'll, we'll mail, mail it to you. This gospel moves. Uh, go back to chapter one. We're gonna we're gonna move with Mark real quick here, especially if I can get actually get it there myself. Mark chapter one. What was a key word in Mark? Immediately, chapter one, verse ten. Immediately coming out of the water. Uh, chapter one, verse twelve. Immediately, the Spirit impelled him to go into the wilderness. Uh, verse 20, immediately he called them. Verse 21, they went to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath. Um, see, that was at 21. Let's look at uh, 28. Immediately the news spread. Uh, 29, immediately they came out of the synagogue. Verse 30, immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Immediately, immediately, immediately. Mark is the immediate gospel, the gospel on, on the move. This gospel gallops like a horse, a racehorse, that the starting gate is open and boom, uh, away the horse goes. And it is just flying around the track. And then we come to chapter 16, verse 8, and boom. The horse stops. If you're riding a horse and this has been going on and boom, immediately the horse stops, what happens to you? You go flying over the head of the horse. You get thrown over and you land with a thud in front of the horse. And that's kind of the feeling we get as, we, uh, as we're riding through Mark and then boom, it stops. And we get thrown over the top and we land with a little bit of a thud and we look up and what do we see we see an alive jesus and to me that makes sense for why mark wrote and the gospel the way he did and the way he ended it it, it all comes together his we see that pace on every page of the book we also see the pattern mark's pattern uh, throughout the book. Remember our key words? Amazed, astonished, alarmed. 
you see that time and time again as <coughs> excuse me as we step into the scene with with the with the crowd with the people uh, let's let's pick up chapter 2 and verse 12 uh, he got up immediately, picked up his pallet, and he went out in the sight of everyone. So they were all, what, amazed. Uh, chapter 4, verse 41. The sea has been uh, uh, very fierce. Jesus has calmed the sea. The wind died down. Uh, verse 39. Uh, became perfectly calm. And what did they do? When they've been in this storm, and then boom, the storm's over. What did they do? What did they say? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Did they did they sing the doxology? Uh, no. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? They were afraid. Amazed. Afraid. Chapter 5, verse 15. Jesus healed uh, the demonized man. And uh, when the crowd saw it, they became frightened. Uh, stick in that same chapter, verse 33. Uh, Jesus healed uh, uh, a woman struggling with a bleeding issue. Uh, she came fearing and trembling before him. And verse 42, uh, after healing Jairus' daughter, immediately, there's that gospel of action, uh, immediately they were completely... <coughs> astounded we could go on and on and on throughout the next several chapters but just come with me to uh, chapter 15 uh, verse 5 Pilate was amazed we talked about that a couple weeks ago in the presence of Jesus and then here in chapter 16 verse 5 as they stepped into the empty tomb they were amazed and then they were afraid our key words, amazed, astonished, alarmed. This is the normal reaction. And, and those words at times blend together uh, and are used uh, closely together. But this is the normal reaction to being under the influence or the presence of Jesus in this gospel which implies that the normal response for us in the 21st century to being in the presence of God is to be amazed, to be astonished, and to be rightfully alarmed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. We'll come back to that one in just a moment uh, and, uh, and pick that up. The abrupt ending fits Mark's pace. The abrupt ending fits Mark's pattern. The abrupt ending fits with Mark's point from chapter 1, verse 1, even into uh, as uh, John the Baptist is introduced in uh, the early verses of chapter 14. Verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then John's words, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark's point from the beginning verse of the first chapter of this gospel is to prove, present proof, that Jesus Christ is God the Son. That's what he's been working at. That's been his target the whole point. And he keeps that main thing plain and in focus throughout this rocket ride Uh in, in 16 brief chapters. Then we come to verse 8. And Mark ends with a complete sentence, a complete thought, with all the elements of the gospel intact, and almost a haunting invite to the reader. Follow this Jesus of Mark 1 through 16. He's presented the proof that Jesus Christ is God who took on human flesh, lived 
a sinless life, died as our substitute on the cross. What are the implications of Jesus' identity? And, and two uh, songs that I suggest to uh, challenge our thinking this morning. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Well, that first song that we talked about and opened with this morning provides some of that answer as we think of uh, the appropriate responsibility or response in the presence of God. Remember this verse, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Do you know the second verse to that well-known song? Remember our keywords, amazed, astonished, and that last one, alarmed, fear, the gospel ended in fear. Verse 2, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. We started with grace. We end with grace. Grace brings us good fear. Grace brings us God's joy for those of us who have believed. God's grace is amazing, and it's available today. Let me encourage you, let me challenge you, as we look at those implications, to look at a couple of applications. Go back for another look. Wherever you're at in your journey with Jesus, go back and take another look at the person who is highlighted in this book in this gospel, we have been given plenty of information to make a legitimate identification of who Jesus Christ really is. Then I challenge you, as, you, as we think of being amazed, to celebrate your spiritual birthday. For some of us, maybe our spiritual birthday begins today as we kneel before Jesus Christ admit that we're a sinner believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son and accept his free gift of salvation I invite you to do that right now for those of us who have done that who've had that spiritual birthday in the past we need to celebrate the amazing grace of God that's active in our life today. Then I challenge you to make these two commitments. Build on what you know. Hunger for what you do not yet know. God's grace is amazing. Make sure his grace that he offers to you has been accepted by you and is, is the driving force of your life. Let me Close us in prayer. Lord, I ask your blessing on each of us as we move forward in the week ahead. May we truly hunger to know more of what the scriptures have to say. May we build on what we already know. May we celebrate our spiritual birthdays. And if we don't have one, may it begin right now as we come to Jesus in repentance and belief. Lord, there is great reason, good reason for us to be confident in the scriptures, confident in the Bible. 
Thank you for all the diligent work that has gone on in the past and that continues to go on today, time and time again. Uh, we, we learn how accurate uh, the translators have been through the years and compared to all the other writings in, in, in the world, the Bible is the most tested and has been proven to be the most reliable over and over again. So may we have a, a healthier respect even uh, for the Bible today. And may we, uh, because it's God's word, dig into it with passion and surrender with joy to its authority. Thank you for your grace. Thanking, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence today and in the week ahead. Uh, for the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.